In the UK, the US and Europe, the new school year is fast approaching. Governments are desperate to reopen schools, and for good reason. But very recent research suggests this could be catastrophic. Why? Let's take a look. Uh, first, a quick apology. Uh, sorry for the delay in getting this film out. Long Covid has been kicking my ass the last couple of weeks, and I'm maybe not quite in the condition to be shooting today, but uh, let's give it a whirl. What's the worst that can happen? Okay, so before we dive into the research, it's probably worth looking at why reopening schools, if safe, is so important. There are two major drivers, although one is probably rather more important to certain populist governments than the other. And that is, of course, the economy. If schools aren't open, a huge slice of the nation's workforce is tied down with childcare. If you can't get children back in the schools, you really can't restart the economy in a robust fashion, says Scott Gottlieb, former chief of the FDA. Samuel Toombs of the Economic Consultancy Pantheon estimates that around 2.5 million workers, 7.5% of the UK workforce, will have had to take leave of their jobs to look after young children. As well as the impact on the businesses they work for, this hits their personal income directly. The ONS estimates that in addition, the wider educational sector contributes around 6% to UK national output. So school closures also have a direct negative impact on GDP. Mr Toombs estimates that if pupils are still only in school around half the time in the autumn, GDP will be 4% lower than otherwise. In cash terms, that would represent damage of around £7 billion a month to the UK economy. You also have to remember that going back to school is big business. Last year in the US, total spending on back to school supplies was estimated to be $80.7 billion. I know I'm jumping a little bit between the UK and the US here in terms of the data, but you can see that the economic impact of schools being open is really quite significant. The second major driver is, of course, child welfare. Closing schools, obviously, uh, has a major impact on the quality of education for children of all school-going ages. Besides the impact on learning, there's also the impact on mental health and social and emotional development. Preliminary neuroscience research suggests that the brains of young people need to be wired for social connection during childhood and adolescence in order to maintain health and well-being. Depriving children of social stimuli during this critical period of development can have long-term consequences. Closure of schools also amplifies inequalities, social, regional and economically deprived areas suffering the most. In some schools, up to 40% of pupils live in a home with no computer. There is a worry this could lead to a privilege gap that might never be able to be caught up. And confinement can aggravate economic problems for families, which can lead to increases in episodes of domestic violence, child abuse and neglect. So along with the third unspoken reason that reopening schools is popular with voters, I mean, name me a parent you know that isn't completely fed up with their kids by now, and you can see why governments are so keen. And when you've got figures like UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warning the world is facing a generational catastrophe because of school closures, it rather adds to the pressure somewhat, doesn't it? What we also have are the success stories of countries like Denmark, South Korea and Taiwan, who have either kept their schools open or reopened them successfully. So what's the problem? This. Confident it had beaten the coronavirus and desperate to reboot a devastated economy, the Israeli government invited the entire student body back in late May. Within days, infections were reported at a Jerusalem high school, which quickly mushroomed into the largest outbreak in a single school in Israel, possibly the world. Other outbreaks forced hundreds of schools to close. Across the country, tens of thousands of students and teachers were quarantined. Israel's advice for other countries they should definitely not do what we've done, said Eli Waxman, professor at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Why did it go so badly? Well, that Jerusalem high school experienced what these two extremely recent sets of research have just concluded. This study from Chicago, published in the Journal of American Medicine, and this manuscript from Mountainous Trento in Italy. Our old buddy, legit OG himself, William Hasseltine, summed up the research in this piece on Forbes. Two new studies, though from different parts of the world, have arrived at the same conclusion. That young children not only transmit SARS-2 efficiently, but may be major drivers of the pandemic as well. According to the results of the Chicago study, children five years and younger who develop mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms have 10 to 100 times as much SARS-2 in the nasopharynx as other children and adults. 
Whenever these young children cough, sneeze or shout, they expel virus-laden droplets from the nasopharynx into the air. Basically, what this study is saying is that young children are essentially viral bombs exploding continuously. And given that young children are also frequently asymptomatic, we can probably also add the word stealth to that viral bombage. And what about the second study from Italy? Children aged 14 and younger transmit the virus more efficiently to other children and adults than adults themselves. Their risk of transmitting COVID-19 was 22.4%, more than twice that of adults aged 30 to 49, whose rate of contagiousness was about 11%. Doesn't exactly sound great for reopening those schools, does it? So how does this information practically affect management of the virus? Professor Neil Ferguson thinks the R value, or effective reproduction number, could increase by as much as half when secondary schools reopen. And it's not even clear whether he'd seen these studies when interviewed, as he told BBC Radio 4's Today programme that the evidence suggested older teenagers could transmit the disease as effectively as adults. The Trento and Chicago studies suggest it's rather a lot worse than that. But let's take Neil Ferguson's 0.5 uh, bump in the R number anyway. What does that actually mean? Well, quite a lot. Quick overview of what the R number means if you're not familiar with it. Uh, the R number represents the number of people an infected person will go on to infect with the virus. Uh, if this number is less than one, it means that the numbers of infected people will over time drop. If the number is greater than one, then the numbers of infected people will rise exponentially. The UK R number under lockdown was reduced to about 0.6 and the virus was largely brought under control. However, since then we've opened shops, we've opened pubs, we've opened restaurants, international travel and holidays are possible again, and the R number is now hovering dangerously close to 1, and in some places higher we're seeing localised outbreaks requiring uh, localised lockdowns. It's fair to say that in the UK we're on a bit of a knife edge. And what about the US? Well, it's not great. Uh, between 50 and 100,000 confirmed new cases uh, every day over the last two weeks. And the true number of cases in the US could be anywhere from 6 to 24 times higher than that number of confirmed cases, depending on location. So I think it's fairly safe to say that in the US the virus is most definitely not under control. Let's do some maths. For the US, let's take a conservative estimate of the R number, currently at about 1.2. Some other assumptions on these calculations as they're just indicative. Let's start with 1,000 infected people, although the closest I can get to on this calculator for some reason is 1,035. Assume that the time to incubate is three days, which is about the current mean, and people are infectious for a week. There's very little data out there on that, incidentally. Some forms of viral shedding may occur for up to 33 days, but generally we can look at respiratory infectiousness lasting around a week. So take a thousand people right now, R of 1.2. On day 100, we have 4,796 people infected. This is obviously pretty bad. And now let's open those schools. A thousand people, R of 1.69, and by day 100 we have 292,955 people infected. So almost 5,000 playing almost 300,000. Wait, of course, this is a simplistic analysis. We have many other tools in our toolbox to control the virus. The American Federation of Teachers has said that for schools to safely reopen, there needs to be better testing and tracing for the virus. And in the UK, testing and tracing is key to schools returning, scientists say. Well, thank God for that, because at least our test and trace system has been world beating for the last two months. Or, as it turns out, not so much. It doesn't work at all. Three months on and contact tracers hired to work on England's test and trace system say they're making only a handful of calls every month and are occupying their time with barbecues and quizzes. It's a total shambles. Data seen by The Guardian appears to show the scale of inactivity among employees, with 471 agents making just 135 calls in two days, around 0.14 calls per agent per day. This figure includes calls to incorrect numbers, voicemails, or multiple calls made to the same individual. How about the American contact tracing system? Well, the country has no national strategy for contact tracing, says Adrienne Casalotti. Chief of Government and Public Affairs at Nacho. Instead, the federal government has said to states, do as you wish, she adds. 
But according to news reports, this week the White House moved to block $25 billion for tracing and testing in the latest pandemic relief bill being considered by Congress, contending that states already have funding. Yet, many states do not have the money to start large tracing programs. And in fact, state public health departments across the US were drastically underfunded even before the pandemic. Both countries clearly need a huge systemic overhaul of their test and trace systems in the next month. Is that likely to happen? What do you think? So, where does all this leave us? Have you ever seen someone under the age of 16 frequently wash their hands, practice flawless social distancing, and wear a mask continuously and correctly for up to seven hours or more? No, neither have I. I think it's foolish to assume that we can adopt some of the same measures in schools that we use to interrupt the transmission of the virus in other contexts. Reopening them is important, but if we do, it's going to be very, very hard to keep a lid on the virus. My expectation is that we'll see schools open for a month, cases will spike, and then the government will be forced to close them again. The only other measures that the government has to reduce the R number by as huge a factor as 0.5 would be to close the entire retail and hospitality sectors, and that is not something that many governments are going to be willing to do. They could shut the pubs and the bars, and they probably will, but then they'll realise it's not enough and something else will have to go too. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but as Neil Ferguson says, don't expect anything to get back even close to normal until next spring. Till next time.